Hey, it's Darius Clark. Congratulations to I-75ers who let me know that they passed the CPA exam this month. From Jacob with his 91 and reg, all the way to Sheikah, who passed far and still has a couple left to go. Look at all the check marks. These green marks mean that they're done. No more CPA review for them. What about you? Where are you on your CPA exam journey? If you didn't pass, don't get mad. Get yourself on I-75 with me, Darius Clark, because the right teacher makes all the difference. I'll save a spot for you on next month's list. All right, what do you have to know about consolidated net income, dividends, and retained earnings? Well, the objective of consolidated financial statements is to present the financial statements of entities under common control as if they were one economic entity. The justification for consolidated statements is economic substance over economic legal form, meaning we know the two companies are still legally separate, but since they have common control, one company owns over 50% of the other, so we have to show the companies as one. And we spent a lot of time on the consolidated balance sheet, but what about the income statement? What makes up consolidated net income? Well, it's the parent's income and expenses for the entire year, plus the subsidiary's net income only from the closing date of the acquisition to the end of the year. So if the acquisition happened in this year and they ask you what's the consolidated net income, then it's the parent's income all year, but the sub's income only from the date of acquisition to the end of the year. So one like this you could see, which of the following is the consolidated net income for December 31st? And it says on November 1st, year one, the sub agreed to be acquired 100% by the parent at a cost equal to the book value of the sub's assets. The closing date was, very important, December 31st. And there were no intercompany transactions and the net income amounts for each company appear below. So notice the deal was announced November 1st, but it didn't close until December 31st. And we always use the closing date, don't we? So we want the parent's income for the whole year. That's 30000 plus 10000 But the sub's income is only relevant from the closing date forward. And since that was December 31st, then there was no time in this year for the subsidiary to contribute to consolidated net income. So consolidated net income for this year would be the parent's net income for the first 10 months up until the day the deal was announced. And then, of course, the rest of the year also, we want the parent's net income. Total of 40000 and that's choice B. All right, how about this now? We're going to change the closing date from December 31st to November 1st of year one. Similar facts, not exactly the same. On September 1st, year one, subsidiary agreed to be acquired 100% by the parent at a cost equal to the book value. The closing date was November 1st, year one, and there's no intercompany transactions. The net income amounts for each company appear below. And they want to know which of the following is the consolidated net income for December 31st. So, of course, we want the parent's income for the full year. That's 40000 What about the subsidiary? Well, the closing date was November 1st, so whatever the subsidiary's net income was, November 1st going forward, that's $2,000. We'll add that. And consolidated net income is therefore 42000 and that's choice C. Subsidiary net income before the closing of the consolidation, before November 1st, would not belong to the parent. That's why we ignored the 7000 Consolidated net income for December 31st would include parent net income for the full year, plus the sub's net income of just 2000 the last two months of the year. And the question asked which of the following is the consolidated net income for December 31st, and the answer is C, 42000 If this were a loss of 2000 or any other amount, we would have subtracted it from the 40000 All right, what happens if the parent owns less than 100%? We know that means there's a non-controlling interest. So what do we show for consolidated net income? Exactly the same because consolidated net income still reflects the entire economic performance of both companies as a single entity from the acquisition date forward. So for consolidated net income, we'll show 100% of the parent's net income for the full year, 100% of the subsidiary's net income or loss from the date of acquisition forward, even if the parent owns less than 100%.
So consolidated net income would still be the same. But our reporting requirements will change because if there's a non-controlling interest, then we'll have to subtract net income attributable to non-controlling interest. And that's the subs net income that the parent doesn't own. So if the parent owns 80%, then we would subtract 20% from the subs net income. And we would show that in the consolidated income statement. So first, it's consolidated net income, the whole thing, less net income attributable to non-controlling interest equals net income attributable to parent shareholders. And this is what remains after subtracting the NCI share from total consolidated net income. So net income attributable to parent shareholders, that's the income belonging to the parent shareholders, and it's often used in computing earnings per share. So these are the reporting requirements when there's an NCI. Whereas if it was 100% owned, then all we would have to show is the consolidated net income, number one up here. So let's try this September 1st, year one, sub agreed to be acquired 80% by the parent at a cost equal to the book value to sub's assets. The closing date was November 1st, year one. There were no intercompany transactions and the net income amounts for each company appear below. Because the parent only owns 80%, now they're going to ask which of the following is the net income attributable to the parent on the consolidated income statement dated December 31st, year one. And the answer is B, 41,600. So the parent full year income, 40,000, but the subsidiary's income post acquisition, 2,000, and the parent only owns 80% of that. So 41,600 is attributable to the parent. But on the consolidated income statement, you've got to show all three. The consolidated net income of 42,000, even though 80% is owned, subtract net income attributable to NCI of 400, that's the 20% of the subs 2,000, and then net income attributable to the parent shareholders would be 41,600. And the question asked, which of the following is the net income attributable to the parent shareholders? And the answer is B, 41,600. Note if they would have asked for consolidated net income, then the answer would have been 42,000 because consolidated net income is shown before the NCI, and then you show the NCI, and then it's net income attributable to the parent shareholders. So all three are shown on the consolidated income statement when there's a non-controlling interest. All right, how about this one? Similar facts. September 1st, sub agreed to be acquired 80% by the parent at a cost equal to book value. Closing date, November 1st and there's no intercompany transactions, the net income amounts for each company appear below. The only difference is that there's a $2,000 loss for the same period for the subsidiary from the date of acquisition to the end of the year. Which of the following is the net income attributable to the parent shareholders on the consolidated income statement, December 31st, year one? And the answer is A, 38,400. You take the parent for the full year, 40,000, and then the sub, from the date of acquisition, they had a $2,000 loss. So consolidated net income would be 38,000, even though 80% owned. Then you would show the NCI. You would add back the net loss attributable to NCI of 400, and that would give net income attributable to the parent, 38,400. Note that when the subsidiary has a loss, the parent's share of consolidated net income increases because the NCI absorbs part of that loss. And the question asked, which of the following is the net income attributable to parent shareholders? And the answer is A, 38,400. Note if the question asked for consolidated net income, the answer would have been 38,000. And we're always trying to anticipate the next question. That's the I-75 difference. And if this were a sim, you'd have to show all three. The consolidated net income of 38,000, then you'd add back the net loss attributable to NCI, they're 20% of the sub's loss NCI is absorbing for the parent. So add back 400. So net income attributable to the parent shareholders, 38.4. All right, now for consolidated dividends. Because consolidated dividends are those paid to parties outside the consolidated entity by the parent and subsidiary. The non-controlling interest share of the subsidiary's dividends, that's going to decrease the NCI balance. Because remember, think of NCI as an equity method investor. So when NCI gets dividends from the sub, that decreases the NCI balance. The parent share of the subsidiary's dividends, that's not going to be reported in the consolidated financial statements 
because no cash is paid outside of the consolidated entity when the sub pays a dividend to the parent. So let's summarize this. The portion of subsidiary dividends paid to the non-controlling interest, that's reported in the consolidated financial statements. It's a reduction of the NCI. And the portion of subsidiary dividends paid to the parent is eliminated in consolidation and not reported in the consolidated financial statements. So remember, consolidated dividends are those paid to parties outside the consolidated entity by the parent and by the sub. So let's try this. They want to know what amount of dividends paid should be reported in the consolidated financial statements of Packy Corp and subsidiary for the year ended December 31st, year four. Well, it says on December 31st, year four, Packy owns 80% of the outstanding common stock of Saycorp. And for the current year, Packy declared and paid cash dividends of 100,000. That's parent dividends paid. And all of that is going to be in the consolidated financial statements. But Saycorp declared and paid cash dividends of 50,000. They're 80% owned by Packy. So only 20% of those dividends will be in the consolidated financial statements. And the question says, what amount of dividends paid should be reported in the consolidated financial statements of Packy Corp and subsidiary for the year ended December 31st, year four? And the answer is what? Letter B, 110,000. Because dividends paid by the parent are 100% included in the consolidated financial statements, but dividends paid by the subsidiary to the parent are eliminated. And that's 40,000 of the 50,000 being eliminated. Dividends paid by the subsidiary to NCI, that's included in the consolidated financial statements. That will reduce NCI on the consolidated balance sheet. And the question asked what amount of dividends paid should be reported in the consolidated financial statements of Packy Corp and subsidiary? And the answer is 110,000, letter B. Now they could ask you something like this also. The Summit Company owns 85% of the outstanding stock of Valley Corp and 100% of the common stock of Coast Corp. So you got one parent, two subs. And on December 30th, both Valley and Coast, two subs, each declared a cash dividend of 60000 for the current year. What amount of dividends should be reported in the December 31st consolidated financial statements of Summit Company and its subsidiaries, Valley and Coast? And the answer is B, 9000 because Summit owns 85% of Valley, so there is a 15% non-controlling interest, and that's the dividends that will appear in the consolidated financial statements. Summit owns 100% of Coast, so there's no NCI, all of those dividends will be eliminated. So Valley's dividend, 15% of the 60,000, the 9,000 will show up on the consolidated financial statements, but nothing from Coast because that'll be fully eliminated since it's in our company. So 9,000 is the only external dividend and it will reduce non-controlling interest in the consolidated balance sheet. And the question asked what amount of dividends should be reported in the December 31st consolidated financial statements of Summit and its subsidiaries Valley and Coast, and the answer is 9,000, letter B. Notice that Summit, the parent, didn't pay any dividends, but if they did, then 100% of it would have been included in the consolidated financial statements. All right, now that we discussed dividends, what about consolidated retained earnings? If you're finding this video from I-75 FAR helpful, and you wanna see the rest of it and more videos like it, Go to i75cpareview.com and get yourself on the right road to passing FAR. Get on I-75 with me, Darius Clark, because the right teacher makes all the difference. I'll leave a link in the description. You want a free trial of I-75 FAR? Go ahead and hit company and the contact us, and I'll set you up with a free trial. When next month's list comes out, will your name be on it?